I do my little talk in two parts. One of them is I come in here in this shocking outfit, this witness by her. I scared her a while ago. It's only been 144 years since the Indians ran around on the plane. So it's and obviously it's a very shocking outfit. It makes me look a lot bigger than I really am. Uh, but basically, I like to tell you what I have on, how authentic it is, um, uh, where I've adjusted it, where it's not quite the way they would have done it. But so you know, uh, and kind of what its purpose was. And then I want to tell you about the life of Quanta Parker. So I think, you know, it makes a little more sense when you get a little bit of background on everything that I have on and its purpose. So I'm going to start with the spear here. This would be a ceremonial spear. Uh, if they were actually using it to hunt, it wouldn't be quite this adorned. Uh, Qantas would have feathers going from the top to the bottom, and his would have all been eagle. If I had eagle feathers, I'd be in the federal penitentiary, so I don't have eagle feathers. I have two red tail hawk feathers, and I have two turkey vulture feathers that came from our farm in Greenville, from Caddo, down the road. Uh, the, obviously, the spear point, since I did this in school, I don't have a big, long metal spike on the end of my spear because... You know, they wouldn't let me take that into a school. So this is made out of wood. It just gives you a look. So you get a general idea of what the spear would look like. When Quanta wrote in parades later after he had gone to the reservations, he wrote in lots of parades and attended lots of events, and it would not be uncommon to see him with the spear, very similar to this, just with a lot more feathers. So that's the spear. Okay, I'm going to get this out of the way. Now, the rest of the outfit... Um, I'm going to start with the shoes. The moccasins I'm wearing are made out of elk. The Comanche moccasins would have also been made out of elk. Uh, the only difference is the bottom of their moccasins would have been buffalo hide. They would have used the bison hide because it's much thicker. And they would have put several layers down as the bottom of their moccasins because, come on, they're running around in West Texas. And, you know, there's cactus and skeet bushes and rocks and everything. So theirs are a little more. I'm wearing mine in, on a concrete floor, so mine are. The bottoms of mine are also made out of elk. So, But they are made of elk. They're just over the ankle, and they're just to protect the feet. The women might have had theirs a little bit more beaded and decorated. The children might have had theirs a little bit more decorated and beaded. The Comanches weren't big on a lot of extra decorations. So the men's were usually pretty plain, just like what I have on here. The leggings I have on are to protect the legs. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, the Comanche spent most of his life on horseback. At age three, the children were tied to the horse's back so they could learn to move with the horse. The women, the children, the elderly, everybody moved on horseback. They were a horseback society. They are the only Native American tribe that did not dismount to fight. They fought on horseback. They're the only ones that did that. So obviously, if you're riding your horse, at 40 miles an hour through the plains of Texas and things are slapping you across the leg, you need something thick to protect your legs. So I'd be, I'm dressed in a winter outfit. This is what they would have worn in the winter. So the leggings, they're thick. Mine are made out of cowhide because it's buffalo hide would have been far too expensive. And you know, I was a teacher, so I only had so much money. Uh, I used an old pair of blue jeans and cut them up for my pattern to make them. And, you know, I sewed them with artificial sinew. I did it in my garage. It took me a while to do it, but I got them made. Uh, they look exactly like theirs did. The only difference is mine are cows, not buffalo. If it was summertime, they would have taken a red cloth, very similar to this, and they would have just wrapped it from their ankles to their knees, just wrapped the cloth around their leg to protect their shins from stuff slapping them. They would not have near this much clothes on in the, in the, in the, in the summer. Okay, the first thing we're gonna get to that's not authentic is my breech cloth. Mine is two pieces, I've got a belt, and theirs would have been one piece. It'd take one piece, it would go over the belt, between the legs, over the belt, and the back. It would be, it would cover their private parts. It was their modesty. Uh, I'm relatively tall for what would have been, what the Comanche would have been. And so I would have had to have two elk skins to make it the way they wore it, which, you know, it was about $150 for an elk skin. I would have had to buy two to make this. So I modified it so you get the look, but I didn't have to buy two completely different elk skins. Does that make sense? All right. I do have on something. I do have things on underneath, so I wouldn't be exposing y'all to anything. So. Um, the coyote, 
skin here, purchased by my mom. <laughs> the uh, coyote skin would be something that early on, before they had the horse, so before the Spanish arrived, it, be, it was what they used to hunt the buffalo. Buffalo do not scare easy. I don't know if you're aware of that. Or the bison, uh, you know, that's what made them so easy for them to hunt by the buffalo hunters, is they could fire the guns right next to them, and the buffalo wouldn't be afraid. They would just stand there. And so they could just get one after another. So what the Indians would do is they would lay the, the coyote skin over their head, where this was laying across their face. They'd get down on all fours, and they would crawl right up to them. And the buffalo wouldn't be afraid of the coyote. Now, as time progressed and they had the horse, that wasn't necessary. They used it for another purpose that I'm going to get to in a minute. I'll kind of go through some of the other stuff now, tie all of that in together. The shirt's called a war shirt. You ladies that are great seamstress can tell that it's not a real fancy. It's just butted up and sewed together. It's not real fancy. There's no folded seams and all that stuff. It's just a thick, heavy leather shirt to protect their body and to keep them warm. Uh, since they do fight on horseback, there is a lot of hand-to-hand of -hand type combat. And so, you know, just a swiping of a a war club or a tomahawk or something like that, unless it's a direct hit, this would help protect their body and keep them warm. The breastplate. This is the only thing that I have on that's 100% fake. It's totally plastic. It doesn't hardly weigh anything, but just the idea of the time it would take to put this together, I thought, I'll just go the cheap route and I'll just buy one that's cheap and, and, and plastic. Now, the purpose of the breastplate is like I just said, since they had a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat at high speeds on horseback, this works just like a catcher's vest, a chest protector in a baseball game. If something hits this, it distributes the impact over the width of the, of the breastplate. So it, if it's wider, it's even got more. If it's narrower, it doesn't have as much. Obviously, you can see it's not going to stop an arrow, it's not going to stop a bullet, but it'll stop an impact to help protect the chest. All right, the one around my neck is real. Uh, the same thing, it's real, but this, this right here weighs about three times as much as this does, just to give you an idea. But this is bone and brass. Uh, this, the, the, what the Comanches use for the white pieces are the lead bone of your birds of prey, your big birds, eagles, hawks, uh, owls, um, vultures, even turkeys. That front, front uh, bone of the wing it's very light, it's hollow, but it's very, very strong. So they are, the, the bones were already hollow, which makes them easier to just kind of file the edges down and run the leather through them to make them. So that's what they're used for. This one is not real. This one is real. Uh, these, are, these are black bear claws. Texas had black bears, not grizzly bears. You know, you see those Indians on TV, and, you know, they have those claws about this long. Those are grizzly bears. These are black bears. This is what they had in Texas. This is a cougar. It's a cougar claw. Okay. Now, the braids, they're wrapped in beaver. So you got the braids, and they wrap the braids in beaver, and they put this, they tie the streamers on them. I'm gonna get to that when I get back to the coyote. Um, just keep it clean. The beaver skins, to keep it clean, remember beaver skins waterproof, the fur is waterproof, so it kept the hair dry and it kept it clean for the most part. The men wore their hair long, the women wore their hair short. Remember, the women's job was to butcher the buffalo. So there's a lot of blood, and you, know, you don't want that in your hair. So their hair was cut short. The men wore their hair long because they believed in it and gave them strength. Now, why braid them? Think about this. A Comanche could ride a horse 200 yards, fire 220 arrows in the size of a basketball, in the amount of time it took a settler to shoot once, reload his gun, and shoot again. So roughly about a minute, they could go 200 yards, shoot 20 arrows, and be very accurate. Now, do you want to be riding full speed with your hair going all over the place and pulling a bowstring as fast as you can? You don't want your hair caught in a bowstring. So they tied it down so it was up out of the way. Headdress is 100% personal preference. You can wear all kinds. You know, you might have one feather, you might have four feathers, you might have to go all the way to the ground. Qantas went to the ground. Now, you did receive arrow, uh, you've received feathers like soldiers receive medals. You, you accomplish some kind of feat, you get a feather. So if they're displaying all those feathers and they have that many, you know they're very significant warrior because they they've got a lot of awards. Does that make sense? 
but not everybody displayed them on their head. Some of them didn't wear anything. Some of them wore lots of them. Some of them wore a buffalo headdress. That's kind of a personal thing. Okay. Now, let me get to the the streamers, the leather, the the coyote, the streamers on my hair, the fringe on the top and the pants. I want you to think about this. The Comanche Nation at its very, very largest was only 16,000 people. That's as big as that nation ever was. Now they, they controlled a land that was 275,000 square miles. It went from the Arkansas River in, in uh, Kansas to the Rio Grande from the eastern edge of the Rockies to basically I-35. So you can imagine this vast piece of land. But at their largest, there were only 16,000 of them. So there weren't very many. And they were divided into small bands. By the time we get to the 1850s and 1860s with Quanta Parker, you're talking under 6,000. There's not even that many of them left, even by that time. So they were small groups. And their raids, their, their raids and their attacks were only done by small groups of people about 95% of the time. There's, it was not like the movies where you see the Indians line up on the top of the hill as far as you can go and they're all standing there. That's not how it really happened. They hit in lightning fast strikes of maybe eight or nine guys. And they would hit and they would get away. Now, occasionally, there were some times where they all kind of joined up together and they hit with big numbers, but that was very, very rare. So I want you to think about this. Our tactic, or the Indians' tactic, was to get the settlers to fire their guns and then turn and charge. That was their tactic. When they're reloading, that's when we want to close the gap. So they ride their horses back and forth about 200 yards away, screaming and hollering and waving and everything they can do at about 200 yards away. And they're trying to draw the fire. Now, I want you to think, look, think about all this stuff I have on and think about what's happening if I'm on a horse and I'm running that horse full speed back and forth. What does all of this stuff do? It bounces, it flies, it spreads out, it creates a lot of whirly motion, okay? No scopes. Think about trying to aim at something 200 yards away that's moving at 45 miles an hour and you can't tell what you're aiming at because it's just a big blurry of movement. So that was part of the distraction. It made it very difficult for them to see, to aim at mass because everything is moving. Second thing it did is it made it look like there was a whole lot more of them than there actually were because of all of the movement and the screaming. It was, it was to create a false sense that you were being attacked by a bigger group than you were actually being attacked by. So that was the purpose of all of this stuff. So that kind of gives you an idea of why they did all this. Now, just a little bit of Indian background here. It doesn't matter which time you're talking about. I want you to think about a red bird, a cardinal. And I want you to think about a male cardinal. What does it look like? Beautiful. It's beautiful. It's bright red. Can't miss it. I want you to think about a female cardinal. What does she look like? Not so much. Not so much. Okay. Why is the male cardinal the beautiful one and the female not? What's the purpose? Track and mate. Track and mate is one. What's the other purpose? It's also to attract danger. It's to get the attention. It's to take. It's to take the threat away from the female and the, and the babies. The males are replaceable, the females are not, when you're talking about keeping a species alive. That's why the Indians were like this. The males were all decked out like this because their job was to protect the females, the children, and the camp. It's to draw the danger away into them. Indians lived as part of nature, not separate from it like we do. We do everything we can to you know, make our houses more comfortable or our travel easier. We change our environment. The Indians were just part of theirs. And so you have to understand, they didn't learn from a Bible or a Koran or a Torah. They didn't learn from a book of laws. They learned from nature. And so a lot of things they did followed what nature would have done as opposed to what society would have done. So you need to keep those kind of things in mind when you're hearing stories about the Indians because you're thinking, well, why would they do something like that? Well, that's what nature did. 
uh, when they hunted the buffalo, they hunted the, sl the slow, the weak. They didn't hunt the big, beautiful buffalo. You know, they didn't want to put a big head on the wall and tell everybody, hey, I shot this beautiful animal. They always took out the weakest ones because that made the herd stronger. You ever watch a hawk go after a covey of quail? They always get the last one. They never get the first one. They always get the last one. They could get the first one easy. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be any harder for the hawk. He's that much better at what he does. But he always takes out the weakling to make sure that the animals stay healthy. Indians did the same thing. Now, let me tell you about Farm Park. That's really why you're here, right? I think I figure if you're in a museum about one of Texas's heroes, you might as well hear about another one, right? I, and I, I was I, I taught Texas history for 25 years, and I believe I, I thought the Quanah Parker story was one of the best stories that I ever had to talk about because unlike most of our heroes, early heroes like Crockett, Bowie, Travis, Bonham, Houston, they were all from somewhere else. They weren't Texan. They all came from somewhere else and became famous for what they did for Texas. But they weren't actually Texans. Quanah was. Quanah was a Texan. So let's go back and let's talk about his mother. In 1836, the Comanches raided Fort Parker in Groves Bay, and she was captured along with her brother and an older relative. Not old, just older than she was. And the three of them were taken to the Comanche camp. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the brother died from exposure. Not that the Indians killed him, but just being out, living the life of the Indians. He was younger, and he did not survive. The older one was ransomed back to the Parkers, but Cynthia Ann wasn't. Cynthia Ann, if you think about it, was probably very fortunate. She had been brought back to the camp, and there was a husband and wife at the camp who had just lost a daughter about the same age as Cynthia Ann. And so they adopted her instantly into their family, and they raised her as a Comanche child. So she learned to speak Comanche. They, they put charcoal on her blonde hair so it would be, look dark. You know, they did everything they could to make her not look like a blue-eyed, blonde <clears throat> little girl. But they raised her as their own. Now, most captives in the Comanches would have to go through a little bit of an initiation, if you will, that probably wasn't pleasant. She kind of avoided that because this family just swooped her in and, and let, used her to replace their heartache. So she grew up with this family, and as she got older, she married the chief, Peter Nakona. Peter Nakona was chief, and then after they were married for several years, she had Quana, then she had uh, Pecos, and then a little several years later, she had Prairie Flowers. So she had three children, two sons and a daughter, and. You know, that's basically where Quanah comes from. Now we get to our first controversy of this deal. When was Quanah born, born? Now there's a lot of, some people say he was born in 1848. Some people say he was born in 1850. Some people say he was born in 1852. Okay? Depend on who you're reading or what you're studying, you're going to get the story based on those things. Okay? I tend to believe that he was born sometime between 1850 and 1852, and here's my reason. In 1867, there was a big peace treaty in Kansas called the Treaty of Medicine Lodge Creek. In this treaty, Quanah was at this treaty, but he did not speak, which means he was too young, because at 17, Quanah was already a war chief. So in 1867, if he was born in 1848, he would have been 19 years old, and he would have been old enough to be talking in this peace treaty, but he was not. So that makes me think that he was probably closer to 17 and was not yet have a voice for, that would be 1850. If it's 1852, he'd have been 15, and that story still holds true. Nobody knows. Nobody knows exactly when he was <clears> born. So I'm just telling that's our first controversy we don't really know. Now, let's tell you about him growing up. Blue eyes, everything else about him looked Comanche, except he was a lot bigger than all the other Indians. Quanah was about six feet tall, about 200 pounds when he was full grown. Most Comanche men were about five, six and weighed about 130. So he was striking compared to most of them. But he did have blue eyes, or gray eyes. He got from his mother. Well, growing up, as you can imagine, as a little kid, he got picked on a lot because of those blue eyes. And his mother was half 
white. I mean, his mother was white, so he was a half-breed. And they teased him. So one day, Quan was about six years old. He's walking through the camp with a friend, and they're going to go out and hunt antelope. They got their little bows and their little arrows, and they're going to go out and hunt antelope. And they'd go out and they'd hunt them. If they got one, they brought it back. Their mother cut it up and put it in the... They had like a stew that just cooked all the time while they were in camp. They would just add to it. Um, so he's going out through the camp, and believe it or not, even the Comanches had bullies. So the little camp bully comes up and says, not to Quanah, but to the friend, where are you going? And he says, I'm going to hunt antelope with Quanah. And the kid says, no, you're not. You're going to go swimming with me. You're not going to go anywhere with him. And he says, you know, I'm going hunting with Quanah. And so Quanah steps up and says, he's going hunting with me. And the guy immediately starts attacking him for his blue eyes and being a half breed and starts taking, making fun of his mother. And Quanah's getting ready to fight this boy. And as he's getting ready to fight, a hand comes down on his shoulder. And he looks up and it's his dad. His dad says, Quanah, what are you doing? He says, he's making fun of my mom. And he goes, he says, Quanah, you've already won. Quanah looks at him and says, what are you talking about? And he says, your friend chose you. It doesn't matter what the other guy does. The friend chose you. Which was early on teaching Quanah about being a leader. He was teaching very early on about being a leader. This is at six. At ten, he was, him and two other boys were practicing their archery skills. Now, they're on a horse, no <clears throat> reins, and they have a, a rope tied around the horse's chest, and it's got a loop on either side. And they have to ride the horse full speed with their bow and arrow, and they've got a leather ball about the size of a basketball on top of a 10-foot pole. And what they have to do is they have to ride by and they have to shoot the ball as they go by, get the horse to stop and turn around with no hands, put their foot in the loop, hang off the side of the horse, come back by, shoot over the horse's back, get back up, get the horse stopped, turn around, make a third pass and lean all the way under the horse's neck and shoot up from under the horse's neck. So they're doing this. Well, Kwana hits the ball all three times. And, and Quanah's dad and grandfather sit stand on top of the hill, and Quanah's grandfather says to the dad, that boy's special. <clears throat> now let's give him a little bit of break. He was half white. He was taller than all the other Indians. So him leaning out underneath that horse's neck was probably quite a bit easier for him than the, old, the little shorter boy. <clears throat> but he still could do it. I couldn't do it. <clears throat> I'm that tall. I couldn't do it. But he's already showing these unbelievable skills, and he's 10 years old. And then disaster happens. His mother is recaptured with his little sister, and they're taken away. Y'all know the story of in the end. She's taken away. And within just a few days, Quanah and his brother actually escape this raid. While it's all happening, they're able to escape. And just a few days later, or maybe a few weeks later, his father is killed fighting with another group of Indians. So now Quanah and Pecos are orphaned. They have no mother, they have no father. The Comanches believed that if the parents left the children, their spirit would come back and watch the children. And they didn't want spirits in their camp, so they had to send these boys off somewhere else. So Quanah got sent up into the panhandle, way up isolated in the panhandle, and Pecos got sent a little bit farther out west, so the brothers were split up. Now, Pecos, unfortunately, did not lived very long after this. He, he got sick and he passed away. <coughs> so Quanah is now living with this new tribe up in the panhandle. All these people he does, doesn't know and they made him the pony boy. The pony boy is the guy that lives, sleeps in a teepee out where all the horses are, not in the camp with everybody else. <coughs> They're isolated, separated, you know, the bottom, bottom, bottom of the rug is where he is. So he went from the chief's son that everybody was expecting great things from to the pony boy. They didn't even let him sleep in the camp. But every 12-year-old has a vision quest. Doesn't matter if you're the pony boy or not, you go on a vision quest. Three days, three nights, no food, no water, isolated, and you are either going to see something happen or you're going to hallucinate something happen. Doesn't matter. 
either it's real or it's not, you're going to see something, some sign after this period of time. So Quan is there. It's the third day. He hasn't seen anything. He's kind of sitting there on the ground. He's facing the east. He's about delirious, and he's watching a little rock, just a little pebble that's on the ground. He's just staring at it, and a rattlesnake starts to slide by the rock. Not to him, just he's just watching this happen. And as he's watching it, an eagle swoops down, snatches the snake, and flies off, and the eagle feather drops right there. It's constant. That has to be it. So he grabs the eagle feather. He grabs a little rock. He runs back to the medicine man or the shaman and says, this is what I saw. And the shaman says, this is great, but you can't tell anybody. He just looks at him puzzled. What are you talking about? He goes, you have the medicine of the eagle. That's the most powerful medicine we have. But you're the pony boy. You can't go around the camp saying, I've got the medicine of the eagle. That's not going to work. So he took a little, he took a little bag, a little medicine pouch, the shaman did. He put an eagle claw, <coughs> a feather, the pebble, and his rattlesnake rattle, and he put it in his pouch, and this would be his good luck charm, his guardian angel. It comes in the spirit of the eagle. And he'd wear this under his shirt or on his chest. I have it out so you can see it. I have a fake eagle feather and a rock. <laughs> but I don't have any of that stuff that would put me in prison. Okay. So anyway, at this point, he's 12 years old. Now he has the power of the eagle or the medicine of the eagle. So he's, his star is still rising, but he's still a pony boy. Well, at about 14, the young warriors like Juana go on their first buffalo hunt. And their job, basically this is how the whole scenario works. They stampede the buffalo. The warriors stampede the buffalo because they want to pick out the weak. They, if they're not moving, you can't tell. you got to have them move. So they stampede the buffalo. And the warriors ride their horses right down up against the buffalo, and they start to pick off the buffalo that they're looking for. I don't know if you're aware, it takes 25 buffalo hides to make one teepee. They're really big. Most people don't realize you could have a horse stand up and walk around inside a teepee. If you can't see, if you see one and it, you can't do that, it's not, it's not authentic. They're big. They're really big. And so they're hunting all these buffalo. Well, the, the boys, the 14-year-olds, they ride on the outside of the herd, kind of away from danger. And they have one job. If the herd starts to split, they have to run down and push the herd back together. Because if the buffalo surround the warrior, he won't get out. He will die. They have to keep the Indians on the outside. And so they're concentrating on hunting. They don't know what's happening behind them. That's what the boy's job is, is to keep the herd together. So he's on his first buffalo hunt. He's riding his horse. A big buffalo bull breaks out of the herd. He pushes in there. His horse is banging against the buffalo. The buffalo won't go back into the herd, so he does the only thing he can. He pulls out his bow, and he starts firing them into the buffalo. Eventually, the buffalo goes down. The herd falls back together. The warrior's safe. The hunt's over. At the night of the hunt, they have a big barbecue. It's a big celebration on the night of the hunt. And so they're having this hunt. And all the warriors stand up in front of the fire, and they tell about all the wonderful things they had done that day. They, bragging was part of their culture. You got up and you told about the things you did. So Juan is sitting there and he's listening to all these, these, boy, these warriors talk about their story and he's eating his fresh buffalo meat and the chief walks up to him and says, don't you have something to say? So Quana gets up and he tells the story. Well, they move his teepee to the camp. So now he's not out there all by himself anymore. Now he's in the camp. Now, I want a little... Just from that story? Just from, just from what he did that day. That was enough to, to get him into the camp. Now, just a little sidebar that I didn't tell you. On the vision quest, an Indian is renamed. So when he has the vision quest and he gets this, you know, he should have been called Striking Eagle or Warbird or something like that. But since his mother had been taken away, he didn't want to change his name because he wanted his mother to know who he was. So he wouldn't let him change his name. Quana actually means sweet smelling, which means he was born in the spring. Yeah. So he he kept the name Quana, even though he probably should have had a much more 
masculine fitting name, but he just kept pointing. So basically, I don't know, have any of y'all ever seen the book called Empire of the Summer Moon? Corn Parker's story? Okay, it's a great book. But basically what that what the Empire of the Summer Moon is, is every year when the summer moon comes out, the Comanches all get together and they make this long ride into Mexico. And they just destroy whatever they can and take it back with them. Much worse than what they do in Texas, because Texas is home. Mexico is not. You know, that's their enemy. The Apaches went to Mexico and you know the Comanches drove the Apaches into Mexico. And so the Mexicans had accepted the Apaches, so the command that you're in, you're our enemy, you're now, you know, you're friends with our enemy, you're our enemy too. So they really did a lot of damage in Mexico. So they're down in Mexico, and Quano's along, further, you know, he's along with them. They're in a plaza, they're in a big shootout with the Mexican military. The chief is out there, a soldier steps out of a doorway behind the chief, pulls up a gun, and is going to shoot the chief, and Quano takes him out. He sees him and takes him out. Okay, at this point, his reputation is now, he's you know, 14, 15 years old, and people are going, okay, this guy's doing things that 14 and 15 year olds aren't supposed to do. And so he starts to, to get more and more and more credit within the, the tribe. Okay? Then our Lord's love story. Every story has a love story. Quanta has a love story too. He's 17 years old, and he's falling in love with an Indian maiden. The only problem is Quanta does not have any family, so he has no assets. He has nothing. Basically, this is a Comanche wedding. You go up to the father and you say, I want to marry your daughter. Here's 40 horses. And the father says, okay, you're married. And that's about it, okay? Well, Quanta didn't have 40 horses. He didn't have anything. So this other warrior came to the father and said, I've got all these horses. I'm going to marry your daughter. And the father was going, you know, this is a good deal. Well, that night, Kwana and the girl eloped. They ran away. And when Kwana left the camp, 12 warriors left with him. Guess what? Kwana just became 17 years old, a war chief. He's got 12 warriors that are following him. So by, by the time he's 17, he's already got such a reputation that warriors are starting to change and follow him. So he spends the next little bit of time just raising havoc on the Texas plains so he can get horses. Then he eventually comes back to the camp, goes up to the dad and says, here's your horses. And they let him come back in. Now, as his reputation is growing, from, I have no way of justifying this. I have no way of proving this. But most people believe that Quanah may have very well been the greatest warrior Texas had ever seen. You know, with all the ones that are there, his reputation, his skill. I mean, Sherman was in Washington, D.C., sent the number one Indian fighter to Texas with one purpose, get Quanah Parker. He's 17 years old, and the United States government is sending the best milk Indian fighter to come get Quanah Parker. That ought to give you some clue on how significant he was on the plains of Texas. Now, <laughs> it's a great story, I thought. It, it, there was a, a show that came on for a while. It was about Texas, and Pierce Bronson was in the show, and he had lived with the Comanches for a while. And in this show, he's sitting there talking to this guy, and this guy brings out all these arrowheads, and he says, hey, these arrowheads once belonged to the great Quan Parker himself. And the guy that had lived with the Indians said, oh, that's really great, because Quanta Parker preferred a 45 and a Winchester 30-30 to a bow and arrow. <laughs> if you say so. Which I thought was kind of funny, because, you know, Quanta Parker's pretty far along in the story, you know. He wasn't using bow and arrows when he was fighting, because they were well armed by this time. So, in 1871, Randall McKenzie, the greatest Indian fighter in the United States, comes to Abilene, Texas, with one purpose— get his troops together, go out on the state plains, and hunt down Quan Parker. Quan Parker gets wind of this. And by the way, he's not Quan Parker yet. He's just Quan. <laughs> so Quan gets wind of this. So what does he do? He raids Abilene while they're getting their supplies and their troops together, just so he says, I'm here. Just want you to know. And he rides off. He tells two scouts. He goes, I want you to stay behind 
and make sure that army can see you and get them to follow you into the canyons. So the scouts said, all right. So the soldiers finally get all their stuff all mustered up together and they head out to hunt down Quan Parker. And of course they're following the scouts trail and they're going through the canyon. And as they go through the canyon, all of a sudden the trail turns and goes up the side of the canyon. And so the soldiers take their horses, they turn and they go up the side of the canyon and realize that Quan is just looping out and he's behind them. So they go out, they follow him around, and they get behind Quanta, and he circles back around. And he's just, just constantly making them chase their tail. He's not attacking them. He's not harassing them. He's not doing anything. He's just making them go farther and farther and farther into the plains. That night, when the soldiers were exhausted, they got all their horses set up, got all their tents set up, got, everybody was in bed. It's about 3 o'clock in the morning. And Quanah and five or six of his warriors came riding through the camp. They took buffalo robes and tied them to the back of the horses so they would drag behind the horses. And they took cowbells. No guns, <laughs> no bullets, no arrows. Cowbells and a buffalo robe. And rode in and out between all the tents, rattling the cowbells. It knocked all the tents down, scattered all their fires, and then they ran off all their horses. So the soldiers are all in a desperate panic, trying to get everything put back together, and just about the time they get it settled down, they did it again. They did it twice in the same night. It took the soldiers three days to round up their horses. If they couldn't find their horses, they had to walk back to Abilene. Mackenzie said, that way's home, and he continued on. This went on all of the, the late fall, winter of 1871, in the winter and early spring of 1872. There was a point where McKenzie said, I've got it. He's moving the whole camp. That means he's got all the women, he's got all the children, they're dragging all the teepees, they're carrying all their supplies. I've got it. So he gets his soldiers to drop everything you don't need, and they went into hot pursuit to try to track him down. He said, no Indian tribe has ever gotten away when we've caught them moving their camp. So he's following along, he's following along, snowflakes start to fall, and they get heavier and heavier, and all of a sudden the trail is completely gone. They can't find any trace of them. The whole tribe is gone. In Blanco Canyon, they disappeared in the snowstorm. <laughs> and guess what McKenzie was stuck with? All his soldiers with no winter supplies. So McKenzie went back to Abilene and said, I'm done with that. We're going to the Rio Grande. We're going to hunt Apaches. This is a leave Point Parker alone for right now. So in 1874, the United States government said, that's it. We're going to do the, we're going to go on the Red River campaign. We're going to force the Comanches, the Kiowa, the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, the <laughs> reservation. And we know there's 4,000 of them that camp in Paladero Canyon. 4,000 teepees in Paladero Canyon. So in 1874, the army came into Paladero Canyon from five different directions and attacked this Indian village, this winter camp. One person died in the attack. The Indians were able to get away, get all their women and children away, but the soldiers had their camp. They burned all their teepees, all their food supplies, and killed 15,000 horses. Now, if you're in, even vaguely familiar with history, you know that the buffalo hunters were here between 1870 and 1874. So the buffalo herds have been almost completely wiped out. So now the Indians have no shelter, no food, no horses, no way to survive. So the question runs through all the soldiers, where's Quan? He wasn't there. Him and his tribe was in a different canyon farther up, like Tool Canyon or, or uh, um, I'm not sure if it's that Tool Canyon or uh, Caprock. Yeah, yeah. But he wasn't at Powder. So he's still out there. He's got 600 warriors. He's got 1,000 women and children, so 1,600 of them that are traveling with Quan Parker. And remember, if he was born in 1850, he's still, you know, he's 20, 23, 24 years old. So he's out there, and they're trying to catch him. 
And they chase him all through the winter and early spring of 1874 and 1875. And they, every time they fight, soldiers die, Comanches get away. But they can't find food. Quan looks at his tribe and he says, my women and children are hungry. They're suffering. I had 600 warriors. I still have 600 warriors. But I cannot provide for the women and children. He rode into Fort Sill, Oklahoma. He rode right up to Randall McKenzie and took his spear and stuck it in the ground and said, I'm done. I'm done. We're coming in. So Quan is the only chief that we know that surrendered without losing a battle. Now, if you look at the Battle of the Adobe Walls, they definitely didn't win that, but it, they got, it kind of turned out to be a draw. Uh, Quanta somehow survived. He got five horses shot out from under him, but he didn't get hit. So Quanta has gone to the reservation in 1875. The Indians are now off the plains. Quanta Parker has surrendered. Now, this is where his story, to me, it's like a whole other life. This is a completely different story than the one he just did. He went from the greatest warrior on the plains to the most difficult one to catch. And then now he's on the reservation. He said, I'm not fighting anymore. In the Spanish-American War, they came up to Quantum and begging him to let his warriors go fight for the United States. He said, I told you, we're done. We're not fighting anymore. Now, here's the deal on the reservation. To live on the reservation, you have to stay there two years and you're not allowed to leave for any reason. Two years. After two years, you're able to travel on and off the reservation. But for two years, you can't leave. So after a year, by the time, by the, time the year was up, Quanta and Randall McKenzie were best friends. Okay? And the funny thing is, is Quanta would live this life as a leader in luxury, and Randall McKenzie would suffer from alcoholism and everything his whole life. But they had become great friends. The Texas Rangers had come up and ask him, is there anything that you need? He says, I want a picture of my mother. That famous picture y'all seen of Cynthia Ann Parker with the baby? That was the picture they got for Quan. It's, you know, it's big. And they put it in, you know, he had that picture of his mother. And he asked the Texas Rangers if they could get his mother and daughter's grave exhumed and brought to Oklahoma. And, of course, Texas did. I mean, that's the kind of guy Quan was. They, you know. These people were seeking him out. Now, after a year, because of all the you know, all these people that had come to see him and everything, after a year, they decided that, that it was okay for Quanta to leave the reservation. So he's dressed like this. They pinned a note on his chest that said, I'm Quanta of the Parker family. Can you help me find them? And they let him leave. So he's on his war pony in his Indian dress, Riding through the plains of Texas, which he once completely raided and were terrified of him, knocked on people's cabin door, pointed at the letter, and they helped him get to Grosbeck, which is amazing. I mean, he shows up. I mean, you were scared when you saw me right there, Starl. Can you imagine what it would be like to have him standing there in the door? So, anyway, he goes and he spends a year with the Parker family. He lives with the Parker family for a year. He learns about business, he learns about farming, he learns about ranching. He takes the name Parker. He learns to speak English. He never learned to write, but he could speak. And after that year, he went back to the reservation. He said, every Comanche child is going to learn to read and write. Guess what the first literate Indian nation was? The Comanches. Because all the children learned to read and write. And he said, number two, we're not farming, it's too hard. <laughs> This farm, it's not going to work for us. But he did learn about money. And so it just so happened about this same time, the cattle drives had to move farther west. They couldn't keep going to Abilene, Kansas. They needed to go to Dodd City. Well, the only way to get to Dodd City was to cross the Comanche Reservation. Okay? And Quanah says, all right. Cows are $4 a piece in Texas. They're $40 a piece in Kansas. I'm going to charge them $2 a cow to cross this reservation. That's not being too greedy. $2 a cow. And, of course, they're willing, more willing to pay it because basically it costs them $2 a cow to get them to Kansas. So this is going to cost them $2 more. So it's going to cost them $4. You're still talking you know, $32 profit per cow. So they're more willing to pay it. So they would 
bring their cattle drive up there, and Quan would ride out there to him with his warriors, and he'd say, how many cows you got? God said, I got 600. He says, that's $1,200. And they'd gladly pay him $1,200. And he would ride back to his TP. That night, so the warriors would go out there and count those cows. <laughs> if there was more than 600, they took them. <laughs> now, the next day, one of two things would happen. Either they would say, hey, we're missing eight cows, and he'd say, we're missing $16. <laughs> or they wouldn't say anything, and the Comanche herd got bigger and bigger. And bigger. <clears throat> so he starts making money hand over fist on these cattle drives. And they're getting more wealthy and more wealthy. Quanah becomes the first sheriff of Lawton, Oklahoma. He becomes an Indian judge. He's starting to travel to all these, like the Fort Worth Stock Show, the State Fair of Texas, the the uh, you know world's fairs, the hemispheres and stuff. I mean, he's going out and he's getting people to, you know, he dresses like this and he goes out and he shakes hand. I'm Quanah Parker, Comanche War Chief. Nice to meet you, whatever. He wants people to start changing their image of the Indian. And so he's doing all this, and he's getting rich. So he buys into a railroad. The Denver-Fort Worth Railroad went through Quantum, which was named after him. And, and he bought that railroad. He, he, he was a, a part owner of the railroad. So the Comanche War Chief is now an industrial baron, making lots and lots of money. So he's doing this, and he becomes friends with Theodore Roosevelt. Because a good friend, because Theodore Roosevelt liked to hunt. So he'd come to the reservation, and him and Quanah would go out and hunt wolves or whatever was left, and they got to be really good friends. So now everything is going really well, but the cattle drives ended. But along when the cattle drives ended, they also came around with barbed wire, and that was ending the open ranges in Texas because people were fencing off the water. You know, they had the range wars. You've heard of the range wars and gunfighters riding the fence rows and stuff. Well, Quanta had a million acres up there that nobody was touching. So the ranchers, like Charles Goodnight and those guys, they went up to Quanta and said, we'll pay you big money if you'll let us graze our cows on your land. He says, sure. They built him a great big house, big ranch house, porches all the way around. Quanta looked at him and said, there's something missing. Put big stars on the roof. So it's got these big stars on all four sides of the roof, giant stars. They call it the Star House. It's in Cleetsy, Oklahoma. He still kept his teepee beside it, but he had his, his house, and he had his big easel with his picture of his mother and his big long headdress and everything, and he had a great big table and seat, like 20 people in the, in the living room, or in the dining room. So now he's really becoming a celebrity, if you will. When he came to the, the Fair Park, to the State Fair of Texas, they sold out immediately. They sold out tickets because people wanted to come see the big Indian. They called him the big Indian. And so he gets on the train in Quanta, dressed in a suit, a vest, slacks, a little bowler hat. And he gets on the train, and they go to Fort Worth because the train didn't come to Dallas. So he went to Fort Worth. He got off of the train, dressed completely like this, got in the back seat of a car, and they drove him to the State Fair of Texas. So when he was at the fair, he was dressed like this. He gave his speech. People were laughing, and he was, he was really was very funny. And then when he got done, he said, well, all these people didn't get to see me, so he just went out and hung out on the midway. Just went and shook hands, and, you know, people wanted to sit crowded around and see the big I like, you know, like I said, if you can imagine, he's about, I'm almost identical to his size. And you can imagine that most of the other Indians were about this big. So he was the big Indian. Now, some of, the Indians up, some of the Indians up north, some of those tribes were a little bigger, but Comanches weren't real big. The Quantum was pretty significant in size. So, let me tell you a little bit of the story, a, little, a couple of the stories. I'm almost done, I promise you. Y'all hanging in there with me just a few minutes longer? With Quantum seeing all these people, I mean, he went to Washington over and over again. He rode in Theodore Roosevelt's inaugural parade. There were four chiefs that rode with him, dressed like this, riding the cars, waving at the cracks. You know, when they gave the, uh, when they built the uh, Buffalo Soldiers Memorial in Oklahoma, him and his warriors rode in the parade in full regalia, right down the street. I gave a talk a few months ago, and I was, I was, in, I was in the restroom, and I was putting the stuff on, and this man comes in, he's 
a very elderly man. He's walking with cane real slow. And he came in and he goes, I was about half dressed. And he goes, well, who are you fixing to be? I said, well, in a few minutes, I'm going to be Quan Parker. And he goes, my dad saw Quan Parker ride in a parade one time. And he said it with such awe. And I thought, boy, I'm going to talk to this guy some more. But he wasn't there for the talk. I don't I have no idea where he went, but I thought just the awe in his was my dad saw Quan Parker right away. Well, anyway, Theodore Roosevelt was trying to help Quan out since he was trying to get, you know, to be well accepted by the white settlers. <clears throat> Quan had five wives. He at one point had seven, but on the reservation he had five. Now, Quana married a lot of these wives because their husbands died. And they couldn't support themselves. So Quanah just took them in so he could support them. It was kind of like a retirement plan, if you will. Death benefit or something. So anyway, he had all these, he had these five wives. And so him and Theodore Roosevelt are talking. Theodore Roosevelt says, Quanah, you know, white society is never going to accept you having five wives. You need to just have one. Quanah looks him dead in the eye and said, you go tell him. <laughs> then also another thing a lot of the Indian tribes did part of the Indian church was that they would smoke peyote that was just part of the tradition where they would smoke peyote and so you know Quanah was a member of the Native American church and so Theodore Roosevelt same kind of thing he says you know Quanah the you know, society's not very accepting this peyote thing. You know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to give that up if you think you're going to be accepted. And Quan looks at him again. He says, "He says, white man goes to white man church and talks about Jesus. Red man goes to red man church and talks to Jesus." <laughs> so he really did have a great sense of humor. There was a family that ate dinner with him every Sunday. Their white family would come and they would sit and they would have dinner with Quanah every Sunday. And one day they had had dinner and they were out in the yard and they were just talking. And the, the husband of the family that came said, Quanah, you, you never have told me how they got you to move to the reservation. So Quanah looks at him for a minute. There's a big log in the yard. And he says, Sit down. So the guy sits down on the log, and Quana sits right up against him, as close to him as he can get. So the guy does naturally. He scoots over a little bit. Quana puts his closer to him. So he scoots over, and Quana scoots over. The guy falls off the end of the log. Quana stands up and says, That's how. <laughs> That's how. <laughs> just scooted just a little bit at a time. But he, he was really, a, he really wanted to change the, at least the Texans vision of what the Indians were. He never, not one time, did he talk about his life as a warrior after he went to the reservation. Any stories that we hear of Quana as a warrior come from somebody else. Not he, he never talked about it, ever. So he, he made that transition instantly. Now he gave away, he, he was wealthy. I mean he was wealthy. And he gave away every penny he had because money was not important to him. If you came to him and you said, I don't have shoes, he gave you shoes. If you came to him and you said, we're hungry, he fed you. He took care of everybody in every way he could till he spent all the money he had, which didn't matter because you know, he was on the reservation anyway. Now, there's a lot of Comanches that, don't, that are angry with Quan Parker. Because he sold the Comanche Reservation. He sold all the land. You know, a lot of them are really mad because they could have casinos. <laughs> but a lot of them are really angry that he sold the reservation. But his, he told them, he said, I don't want you to live on this piece of land for generations, living off of handouts from the government when you can go out and you can be somebody. Go out and become doctors and lawyers and preachers and teachers get off this reservation and go live a life that you make a Comanche proud. So there's those that are, of course, we really respect him for that, but some of them were still a little angry that they kind of gave away the farm. He died in 1911. So he was somewhere between 59 and 63. 
And this, to me, this was the biggest, the, probably the greatest compliment that you could have to Tuan Parker Comanche Order. His obituary was in the paper in Paris, France, London, England, Madrid, Madrid, Spain, and all over the United States. He never left the United States, but his story had gone out all across. He wanted to, he, he had them take him to the place he was born. He spent three days there. He had gotten off of, he, he got back from the trip, and he was really sick, you know, congestive heart failure kind of thing. And so he, they were trying to take him to the hospital, and he said, I'm walking off this train. So he, you know, get away from me, and he walked off the train. They took him to the doctors. The doctors said they could help him. He said, uh, you know, I've done everything I need to do. He walked out of the hospital, got in his car. They took him to the place that he was born. He spent three days there, went back to the reservation, and passed away. That's the story of Quantum Park. Any questions? Did he do the alphabet? Is there an alphabet? Or is that somebody else? That was not him. Was he, he learned to speak English very quickly. Uh, I don't know if y'all are aware, but you know, since this is the, kind of the Audie Murphy Museum, you always hear about the Navajo, the Cherokee code talkers. There were Comanche code talkers too, and the Comanche name, the Comanche language is almost gone. There's very, very few people that can actually speak Comanche. I can. It's, it's a very, it's a very formal language. The Aztecs spoke it too, the, the, not the exact same one, but one from the same derivative. So when a Comanche spoke to you. It was, you know, very formal. Their language was very formal. Uh, one, one person had said that the Comanches, uh, the Comanches, no one was more civil in peace and more ruthless in war. And a, a famous Texas historian said about Quanta Parker, last thing I'm going to leave you with, they said, it didn't matter where in life Quanta Parker was born, he would have been a leader, a king, a president, a chief. He was that so. Any other questions? I'm a little confused on the feathers story. Could you use feathers in your headdress if they hadn't been received as a honor? You, you could. Okay. They probably wouldn't, because everything was about honor. So where did we get? The feathers that became the honors. I mean, did they, 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 they Native Americans find it on the ground. No, the Native Americans could. They they could kill eagles. They oh, still okay. can. Oh, they can. Yes, they can. They, that is okay. one of the things. And so right. they still use authentic. But the the strange thing is, is if, if I'm not mistaken, you can't go onto Indian reservation and buy one with eagle feathers and take it home. You're breaking the law. Only right. the Native Americans can be in possession of yeah. And I did hear of that just recently at the program they had at uh, the Warren, Touch of Warren Center. Uh, a lady who did buy but got arrested. Yes, <laughs> yes. You know, and, and I don't know. I mean, you, you might could get in trouble for having hawk feathers, but nobody's ever bothered me. And, and I did just pick them up off the ground. And, and is it... To find one on the ground, is it supposed to mean bad luck or good luck or anything no, uh, like that? No. Okay. But their headdress was received as an honor. Yes. Okay, and, that's what I did get and, straight. And they're, they're, you know, they were, everything about them was about this honor, it's this code. Okay. And so it, it, would be, it would be very unlikely that they would have a headdress if they hadn't earned that. But headdress. some of the Indians didn't even have headdress. Right? Exactly. Okay. But they might have those feathers somewhere else. Oh, but they could have their feathers. Yeah, they would still keep them, but they okay. wouldn't necessarily wear a headdress. That's the only thing because I Because let me tell you, this headdress is That's the only thing I need to get here. The headdress is pretty warm. Where was the star house and where is Quanta buried? Quanta is buried at Fort Seal, Oklahoma. It's his grave, his mother's grave. Is there a special grave. cemetery? What? I yes, look, but I it, it is not in the, where the Chiefs Hill, oh. it's not there. But it, it's one of the first things that you come to there as you come into the cemetery. They're big pink granite markers. Oh. They're three just alike. They're just I see. different size. But he is very important. On the base. In that same cemetery, you know, everybody goes to see Chief Hill, but that's not where he is. Oh. He had a little more influence there than, than a lot of those people did. 
and the Star House. The Star House is in Caliche, Oklahoma. And it's it's in you can't really visit it anymore because it's 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 in pretty much disrepair, but you can see it with the big stars on it. Where is Caliche? Uh, it's in south it's in southwest Oklahoma. Well, all this is near Lawton. West of Lawton. Yeah. Lawton near Wichita Mountain. All that was where the reservation was in that area. I had a I had a lady that was telling me um, the last talk I gave, she was from she was from the Oklahoma Lawton area. And uh, you know, many, many, many years ago she would talk about going to the train station and, and you know the Comanches would just hang out at the train station because you know, that was Quanta Railroad. And if you've been to if you, if you ever go through Quanta, Texas, you know it's like on the way to Amarillo. If you go through, go ahead and pull off and go to the square and read his, he blessed the town. So there's a statue of him and his blessing for the town. It's kind of interesting. Anything else? Can we tell you about the Indian word that he wanted us to learn to read and write? Who, who taught those Indians? The, the Indian. Those Indian schools. <coughs> They brought they brought in teachers just like they would, you know, just like a frontier town. And, you know, they had a teacher that would teach the kids. And, you know, probably I'm I don't know this for a fact, but I'm sure many of them were Quakers. You know, the Quakers because the Quakers did a lot of work with the Indians in the reservations before the final showdown. So a lot of the Quakers, you know, they didn't believe in violence or anything, and so they thought they, these people would treat the Indians more fairly than Indian agents did. You know, Indian agents usually took what they were supposed to give the Indians and sold them the line of so, yeah. I hope you enjoyed it. That's my story. Easter After Dark is coming up for those of you that participate, like to do that. That's our adults only Easter egg hunt. It's going to be April 3rd this year. We've already started selling tickets. Um, and enjoy and have a great day.